Um, if you're willing, just uh, pop on, uh, say um, who you are and what institution you're from, and then we'll we'll dive into the screen share. And I can get, maybe I'll call people out because I realize, I think Zoom doesn't necessarily show the same order of people to everyone. So I'm Terry Brady from Georgetown University. Maybe uh, Texas A&M folks, if you can introduce next. I'm James Creel, software developer at Texas A&M University Libraries, and I'm joined by uh, five of my fellow software developers. Jeremy Huff, William Mulling, Jason Savell, Ryan Lattisaw, and Kevin Day. Great. And Tim? Sure. Hey, all. I'm Tim Donahue from Duraspace. And Art? I'm Art Lowell from Admire. All right. Uh, Bill? Hi, I'm Bill Hansen, University of Minnesota Libraries. Great. OU Libraries? Hey, David Corbley, OU I Libraries. Right. Eric? Uh, yes, Eric Hansen, uh, Digital Content Metadata Specialist at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Great, and Chloe? Chloe said that she doesn't have a mic. It looks oh, like sorry, didn't uh, see that. Metadata right. librarian at Cornell. Thanks. And Drew. Hi, I'm Drew Helis. I'm at Johns Hopkins University. All right, great. Well, thank you all for, uh, for joining today. And uh, we'll get started with Art's uh, presentation on uh, using Postman for, for talking to uh, various uh, DSpace services. OK, I'll see if I can get this screen share thing to work. Uh, can you see my screen? Should okay. be a presentation. Okay. So uh, I made these slides as a reference and maybe perhaps if you want to share them afterwards, but I don't think I'll be referring them. You know, we'll going back to them all the time. I'll just uh, work in Postman most of the time. So basically um, I got uh, talked into this by Terry. I really went to him after his presentation just to tell him one quick thing about the postman that was relevant to his presentation he said you must give a presentation on developer show and tell first of all i'm not a postman expert i just use it for some things in my work and i'll try to explain uh, how i make use of it uh, and of course you can always find people who know lots and lots more about it because you can use it for testing running autom automated scripts and stuff like that i just use a few of the basics but i'll try to explain them as best i can so uh, when it comes to solar, uh, I'm gonna move the little screens here so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, so when it comes to solar, um, you usually uh, want to uh, tunnel to a remote server because uh, solar is uh, by default only available from localhost for security reasons. So the first step I do when I uh, want to talk to a DSpace of solar uh, usually is to SSH uh, to that server and open a tunnel. So you do that by uh, uh, in Linux and in Windows these days as well. You can use it with the terminal on Windows these days. You can SSH server name uh, minus L and then first you have the, the local port, then local host and then the remote port. So we'll start by doing that. Oh, I, I already did that. Oh, I'll do it again <laughs> to make sure the connection still works. So this is one of our demo servers for our statistics module. Um, so it's running at the local port of uh, 7,150. That's the Tomcat port. And I want to do that, uh, use the local port of uh, 9,999, which is the port I usually use for tunnels because ports like 8080 or 9090 are usually in use for local servers. So uh, if I now do a call with Postman to localhost, oh, I don't know. I believe it's called preview solar over there. I should get a reply. That's, uh, I said 9090. It's of course going to be, well, uh, not JSON, so I'll put it to text and it's gonna, just going to say, yeah, we're Tomcat and this is uh, the default HTML. 
So um, when working with tunnels, let's get to the first thing that I think is useful about Postman. It's you can have uh, these environments. I have a few. I have a local host 8080, 9090, and 9999. And these basically allow you to define variables. So uh, I have a base variable that's matched to localhost 8080 or uh, 9090 or 9999. So I'll do that now. And now I can just replace this whole part with base. And I still get unexpected because JSON is default, but it still works. And if I switch to a different environment, I'm gonna get that there's nothing listening there. So I can easily, if I have a local uh, instance of solar and remote DSpace, I can easily switch between them using the same queries um, and just switching the environment. You can of course add uh, multiple uh, variables to your environment, but I don't tend to do that. I have a few globals that I tend to set up for uh, when I start working on a new project. So in this case, uh, we're working with preview solar. So I have a context variable uh, that is called preview solar and I'm working with the statistics core. So I have a core variable that says statistics. So I can do something like this. Yeah, I'm gonna use the autocomplete here just so you don't have to watch me type. So this is a really basic query uh, that will return JSON this time. And now that should work. So if I go to my globals, uh, so we can see it has, um, well, uh, quite a lot. It's over 3 million uh, statistic hits uh, and it's number found. If I now change my global variable to say that I want, uh, want to work with the search core, that number should change. And as you can see, there's not a lot of items, just uh, 184. But that immediately um, shows you how useful these variables can be. Um, and there's another t useful thing in uh, Postman I tend to use, and these are collections. And you can use them in conjunction with variables. Actually, you can have uh, additional variables for each collection. Uh, let me see here if I edit, that's it. You can have additional variables here and authorization settings and all uh, those sort of things. So you can, if you use the query from this collection, you can always authorize in a certain way. I'm sure Terry is gonna explain a little bit about that in his presentation. You can run certain scripts and tests uh, um, with, uh, for, for each request in that collection. So it's really useful if you wanna set up automated API tests. But uh, like I said, I use it in, on a much more basic level. So I have a bunch of queries here I just think are useful and uh, which I usually start from and make a few variations on if I need anything. So a uh, really common one is the one we're looking at now to, just to get the number of records. So that, that's basically the query I just ran. And then you found the, uh, have the num found here that says how many records there are. I have a query that allows you to commit. So um, uh, globals, I did that. Um, so this query, um, works on the update endpoint instead of select endpoint and sends a little XML snippet that tells uh, Solar to uh, commit its index because Solar uh, doesn't update, update its index automatically uh, or, or every time a new record is added, it does it every 15 minutes or every 10,000 docs by default. So if you're trying to test something, you've changed about uh, your statistics, for example, and you generate a few hits and you want to see the results right away, you'll have to commit manually. So that's a useful one. Um, there's also a uh, delete query I have here. So uh, yeah, you can always click on the params here and then edit them in this editor or you have a nice bulk edit view here so you can copy and paste them to somewhere else. So uh, the delete is also an update query and it has a little XML snippet here. And in here you can type just uh, anything that you, that would fit in a normal solar queue parameter. So um, in this case, it would delete uh, the item with the document with ID this here and then type two. Uh, I would recommend of course, that you always try to query first in a select, see exactly what you get before you run the delete because it will delete it immediately. And it is followed by commit true. So it will also update its index after it's done deleting. 
So uh, those are a bunch that have uh, the core variable in here because they're useful for any type of solar core, not just uh, DSpace related or uh, search or statistics related. Now here are a few that are dedicated to search. So I have here a bunch of uh, parameters that are useful when you just want to query the core like you would discovery. So you have this query field here uh, and anything I type in there would give a similar set of results as uh, what I would get in discovery. So if I test it here, I should get results um, that is, they are just all their titles and handles. Uh, I don't know why everything is twice in this repository. It seems like a, a bug. But um, I'll go over the, the parameters to see what we've got. So you have the query field default that is star colon star, meaning everything. Um, but you can, of course, replace that by a specific query. Uh, rows is the number of results you want to get back. Uh, WT tells us we want to get back JSON. Then I have a bunch of filter queries. Uh, one says I want to exclude. I have a, a minus sign here everything that has withdrawn set to true, and I want to exclude everything that has discoverable set to false. The reason for writing it in a, in a negative way is because that also will include things that don't have the withdrawn field and don't have the discoverable field if you write it this way. Um, so I want only items, so search result, resource type is two, and I want uh, only things that group zero has read access to, meaning anonymous users. And then this FL parameter just says which fields you're gonna get back. So uh, if I wanna, if I'm working and I want a, a variation on that, you can easily just check out, for example, the field lists and then you'll get everything. Takes a bit longer, of course, because there's full text in there, I believe. So maybe that wasn't the best example to give. Yeah, here we go. So yeah, now we get all the fields back. And then simply don't save the results uh, or just copy the URL or save as something else if you think uh, you, you've made something useful. Uh, but usually I just, if, I, if it's a one-off, I don't save the results. Um, I also have one for a specific handle. So that's basically uh, I have a single row here and then the handle. I don't know if this is a handle that will work in this repository, we'll check. Again, I think it does work because otherwise it wouldn't take so long. And that's useful if, if you want to see what everything is that's being indexed for a specific item. Um, I have one that uh, facets by collection. So that will basically uses all those same parameters that's in the, the standard search filters, but it also enables the facet uh, value on true and it says I want the facet on location collection. And I'm also saying uh, I want zero rows. I'm not really interested in regular search results. I just want the facet results. And that should go a lot quicker. Uh, and we see here you have collection 24 has 40 items, collection 19 has 34, et cetera. Incidentally, uh, you can get that for in, as XSL or as JSON from Solar, but I tend to use JSON because it's easier just to select something and uh, paste it in a text editor and do some kind of uh, operation on it later. In XSL, you always have to remove the tags, uh, so that's a little more work. Uh, I have a facet by type that's pretty similar to collection, so I think the only change here will be that it's faceting on search resource type. So for statistics, I have a similar uh, standard set. Uh, well, the is internal here is a strange one because that's, that's unique to our module. So disregard that one here. Um, I have uh, the is bot, the minus is bot is true. So that filters out everything that is, a, is, a, is flagged as a bot already. And then here we have the same logic as before with the not. Uh, so this filters out everything that is not uh, any statistics type and not, uh, not statistics type view. That basically says I want all views and things that don't have a statistics type. Reason for that is uh, because all these spaces didn't have the statistics type field. I believe it was added in either three or 1.8 or something. So if you have very old statistics, uh, you'll also want to include the ones that didn't have the view fields. 
And we do the same thing for bundle names. So this basically will filter out all hits for thumbnails and things like that. Or, uh, and because it's uh, framed in this negative way, it will also include views, meaning records that don't have the bundle name fields. So this is a good default set of statistics filters to start from. Uh, again, I'm going to make the presentation available after I'm done. So you can just copy paste those. You don't have to type them if, if you're interested. Uh, so good set of standard filters. If we run it, uh, because the number of rows is zero by default, we'll just see the number of uh, publicly available, not bots, uh, not thumbnail statistics again. So that's a lot less, uh, a lot fewer than those 3 million we had. It's about, uh, what is that, 98,000. So the very large majority of those is bots and thumbnails. Uh, it's, it's a test server uh, with, with generated statistics. So uh, I wouldn't pay too much mind to those actual figures. Um, a useful thing to do when you're looking at these pay statistics is uh, look at the most active IPs. If you're interested in um, bot traffic to your server that's not already flagged, you can run this query. Uh, again, it has the is internal filter. You have to, that's not in the vanilla D space, but uh, the rest is. Uh, so it looks at the top 20 IPs. That's a facet limit. It uh, uses the min count here. We haven't encountered that before. That basically says don't include empty facets. So uh, if you don't do that, you'll see the, the bottom of your top list will always be a bunch of things that have, have all zeros. So with the min, coin, min count, you can say it, uh, each group needs to have at least one hit or more if you, if you want to. And then facet on IP and we get something like this. And we can see in this server that there's definitely something fishy going on with this IP. It has a very large majority of the hits and everything else. Well, this is also very fishy with the, uh, so this is one I would investigate further. And in a real situation, uh, you wouldn't see this large discrepancy. But uh, then again, I have the items for IP query. I can now use and just paste in this IP if it's not already the same one. And uh, the difference here is that it filters by the IP we just had and then it facets, uh, facets by owning items. So I can see which items this IP has been hitting. So uh, suspicious activity or bot activity uh, sometimes happens uh, because I don't know, one or two items get inflated a lot. So if you see I don't know, 10,000 hits on one item and then zero or a few hits on all the others, you can uh, know that it's suspicious activity. So uh, again, in this case, it seems to be spread, well, relatively smoothly. So uh, it, it could also be a, a VPN in this case, like a, an entire university, which all its traffic is uh, routed through, through a single IP address, and that's the one that DSpace sees. Uh, that's something you would consider with an IP like this. So another thing you can do is uh, group your traffic for an IP by a certain time period. Uh, it's already the, the right IP, I see. So you can uh, use the facet date here uh, and say I want to facet uh, by time. And then I have here a date gap, and this basically says plus one day, but you need the URL encoded. And there's another useful thing in uh, Postman that you can do that on the fly. So you just select something and you can encode and decode there. Uh, I have to have a, a start and an end date. And I basically, the slash day at the end basically says, uh, round it to the nearest day. Of course, with, with these exact dates, it's not necessary because they're already on the exact date line, but in case you have like a timestamp you paste from somewhere, you can use that uh, to round it to the nearest day or month or year, because uh, this, this is all, uh, all valid as well, of course, if you, if you want to group it by month or year or whatever. But we're gonna group by day. And then we see that this IP address didn't do anything until uh, the third, uh, no, the, the 17th of March when it started uh, well, downloading multiple items a day. What you usually see with bot IP addresses is that either there's like 
one or two days where it downloaded all the items it has, or there's a very regular number of uh, items every day. So like 250 every day consistently for months on end. Um, so in this case, uh, this reaffirms that this is probably like a proxy for a big institution uh, because it's, it's, it's very random. There's not really a pattern. Um, I have a few others that may be useful. I have a, a pivot query here that could be useful. I'm saying here, uh, I want to not only facet, but I want to pivot and first country codes by country code and then by type. And that basically says uh, facet each country again by type. So this way I can see um, which, so, uh, which 50 uh, are the 50 most active countries on my repository. And then for each country, I can see how many views that they get and how many downloads that they get in the same query. Well, I can see I can see more, of course, because this is these are items. Uh, these are like community homepages. These are collection homepages, or it could be the other way around. I have to check my DSpace constants file, and these are downloads. And then I can see that's the US, and in total they have all that, and it's split up into this. So that's very use, useful if you want a bunch of information all at once. Uh, I think I covered most of my uh, useful defaults. Let's go through this quickly. That's it. Um, anyone have any questions? So Erda, I was curious for the, the features of Postman that you're taking advantage of, like did you did you just read the documentation? Did you find a training on it or did you just kind of hack around and, and discover the difference? I read somewhere in an article that was about REST APIs, about the environments, and then the rest I just figured out for myself, basically. So just the environments that they were useful if you had, well, like a production server, a test server, and a development server. Uh, people use them for that. And then basically the rest I just clicked around and see all oh, collections that's useful because I can store them, etc. Uh, I'm not doing this at the moment because I made a few changes to these for this demonstration, but you can also sync them to a, a Postman account and then they're available on every Postman instance you run and that's free. And that also includes your history as well, by the way. I have a, a question, Art. Um, this is Jeremy Huff at Texas A&M. Um, I've been I've been using Postman in uh, my uh, development on the uh, Folio project, uh, just because there's yeah, it's been incredibly useful. Uh, you know, doing the sorts of things that that, that you're uh, showing here and, and being able to uh, you know do like a lot of the bootstrapping work real fast. You know through scripting and stuff, but we've discussed internally the idea of a sharing between our team here, uh, the, you know, these, these uh, collections and, and uh, workspaces on like a Git repo or something like that. In your experience with this, would something like that be useful or uh, feasible with Postman? Yeah, definitely, because you can export everything to JSON, if I remember correctly, although I haven't done it in a while. Uh, you can say somewhere that I want at least all these collections exported to JSON. And of course they have a, a premium uh, program. I don't know how much it costs. I never really looked into it where you can just um, use it as a group and then you can share these collections uh, with your group and define which, which things people in the group can see and which things they can't. I have no experience with that because I don't have it, but it's, if you're serious about it, I would look into that. And uh, the basic thing you can definitely do is export these collections as JSON and then uh, share those on a Git repository. So I guess the second part to that question is in the context of DSpace um, and its REST API, does anyone think it might be useful to share out uh, maybe DSpace specific, uh, you know, kind of Postman routines and, and things of that nature for the community and a larger context? 
I think that's definitely useful. Uh, in fact, I didn't consider it while I was making the presentation, but I'm willing to just export this collection and share it with the presentation so people can just import it and use it as they like. Cool. Yeah, that'd be really awesome. Yeah, and certainly I imagine like as people come up with techniques for um, authenticating and then wanting to preserve authentication tokens through a whole session, particularly when we're doing more than just querying, I think, I think we're going to find that's like really essential working with the REST 7 API. Okay, any more questions? Well, Art, thanks so much. I, I learned a lot um, from, <laughs> from watching this. My, my usage of this tool has been so much more chaotic because I've not taken the time to really <laughs> understand the difference between the environments and the collections and the folders. Uh, so it's nice to see a, a well-constructed uh, set of tests here in one spot. No problem. Yep, thanks, Art. Then I'll stop sharing. Great. And then I'll, I'm going to do uh, just a brief um, overview um, using some materials that's, it's, uh, that are designed as a tutorial you can run um, on your own after this session. So let me uh, pop this up. How is my desktop looking? Is the I can see your web browser and Slack's yeah. behind it. OK. Is it filling the screen? Yep. OK, great. So um, I have got a link here in our uh, show and tell notes, um, both to the, the download for Postman if you don't already have it. Uh, the other thing I've got a link to is uh, some tutorial instructions that we created for the um, DSpace 7 workshop at Open Repository. And uh, we had kind of a, a specialized version of the um, REST API Andrea Bellini set up for the workshop, and then he actually made some modifications to that API in the course of the presentation. Um, but there's there's a link here uh, for an active API. You can use this link, or you can use the the standard REST API link. But what the the main thing I wanted to show you all is the authentication process, because I think as as folks want to dive in and start playing with the um, the DSpace Seven API. You sort of, um, many many actions beyond queries are gonna require authentication. So I wanna make sure folks have a good, good sense of comfort of how to do that um, moving forward. So first off, I just wanna show you the um, DSpace uh, 7 API has uh, this thing called the HAL browser. And if, um, in case for, for folks who haven't seen it, it's sort of an, an entry point that becomes like a, a self-describing site uh, making available all of the endpoints of the new REST API. So for instance, if I want to see all of the communities in this repository, I can navigate to the communities endpoint, um, click on it, and you'll see that this site has two communities um, that were returned. I can click on a particular community and see details about it. Also, there are additional actions that are available. So I could see all the collections within this community by clicking here. There's also some facility, and I think this, this will be evolving over time for performing um, other actions. So some create, update, delete through the um, how browser interface. But, you know, I think I think some actions are going to be complicated to rely solely on the HAL browser to perform um, navigation actions and, and other things. So what I want to do is show you the process of um, creating an authenticated session within um, Postman. But first, I want to show you the authentication process uh, just using this HAL browser. So I am going to um, come to the authentication endpoint and just check my status here. And right now, we have no, um, we're not authenticated, according to um, the API. So the next thing I want to do is um, 
log in. And within the, our documentation here, we've got a little um, cheat sheet of the credentials to use on this particular API. So I'm signing in. Sign in has been successful. So now my browser is retaining the appropriate um, header information to keep my session logged in. So if I come back to this authentication endpoint, hit status, hmm. I expected it to um, remember my login state. So. Okay, so now I, I I did a refresh. Now it's showing that I am authenticated, and we can see information about um, who I am. So there's a, a person named Demo um, that I'm logged in as. So now what I want to do is um, walk you through a similar process um, using um, Postman. So let me, I'm, I've got some cheat sheets here in this tutorial, which um, I recommend if you're curious about this, uh, try running this um, yourself. So I'm going to um, grab the URL for this repository, open up Postman, and actually like um, Art had done, I do have a few things that I've saved off um, as saved requests here on the left-hand side. So one of the first um, tasks I want to perform is I want to um, get all of the items in the repository. So here we, we ran this query, several items came back. And if we scroll down to the bottom of this list, We will see a count of the number of items that have been returned. So um, 271 items were returned. Next, what I want to do is um, perform a, a browse of the repository. So here, um, what I'm going to do is uh, browse this repository running a query of research. This will bring a, a smaller set of content back. So here is, uh, sorry for this. Okay, what I wanted to look at is, um, here we've had uh, 13 results that have come back from our query. The next thing I wanna do is now actually perform a login um, by going to, um, I'm going to post to the um, login API and just to show you the parameters I'm using, I'm using that sample um, email address, sample password. I'm gonna send that request on. So now I have authenticated and this bear token is returned uh, from the um, API. So this is what we use to retain our login session. So actually, um, what I want to do is show you first um, uh, my authentication status using Postman. So here you'll see our authentication status is false when I run authen status. Next, what I'm going to do is pass in um, 
a header with my request. And actually what I'm going to do is pass it in as a bearer token. And I'm going to update the value from the value that I used previously. I'm now going to send this authentication status with the bearer token that we got from the login action. We'll click send. And now you'll see our authentication status is true. Uh, there's some details about the user that's logged in. And now what I can do is come back uh, to that query that we ran where we search for research, rerun the query, and so in this instance we're oh I, I see what we're doing so we're still getting 13 items back but what i'm going to do is modify this request i'm going to set our bearer token for the so this is performing a discovery search i'm going to send my request in And now when the results come back, you'll see we get a total elements of 162. So this just kind of what I wanted to highlight here is the process that you would follow to authenticate a session using Postman. And then once you've got the Postman interface up and running, you have the, abil the ability not only to send GET requests and POST requests, but you can formulate the whole variety of different uh, request types that are uh, supported in HTTP and in, and in particular the new REST 7 API takes advantage of several of these different verbs. Um, so from here then that, that should allow you if you're, if you're working with the code and you need to perform a, a delete action or you need to perform a put action, Postman's a great tool to uh, perform that task. So any questions folks have? All right, well then I will uh, turn things over to James to show uh, off uh, some of the tools they've built at Texas A&M. All right, uh, thanks Jerry. Um, so now it's my turn to attempt the ever perilous Screen share. <laughs> okay, so uh, what do folks think? Do we see a desktop and um, browser window? Yes, we do. That's what I like to hear. Okay. So <clears throat> I think we've seen a lot of uh, kind of developer oriented tools today. Um, it's been very interesting. I think we'll try to use some of this stuff in our environment when we operate with developing against the DSpace REST API. Um, but what uh, we here at a and are gonna show today is um, kind of uh, some software that's more focused towards end users. Um, and uh, we're calling this the metadata assignment GUI providing ingest and export. And we've um, also had some success testing it against Fedora repositories and um, um, Archivematica as well for preservation applications. But today we're going to look at the DSpace side of it. And this is coded against uh, the DSpace 5 and 6 REST APIs. So we'll definitely have some work to do when um, we go the route of upgrading to 7. But um, what we see here is, OK, so I'm. Um, Refresh the page and see how we're doing. Okay, so I'm logged into this interface and we see our branding and everything. And there's there's two tabs, documents and my assigned documents. And if I go to documents, I will see that um, the system is already aware of some um, possibilities for document processing that are on its file system. Um, they're organized by project, and I currently only have one project in the system. This is running on my local uh, machine. And nothing is assigned yet, but I'm also going to show you now how uh, content can be read into this uh, system. So here's a look at the log, and then here's another terminal where I'm going to um, throw some content at it, and we'll see what happens. 
So, oh. let's see if I can make another uh, document. And uh, what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm just taking um, a directory full of files. In this case, it happens to be a bunch of TIFFs and a PDF and a text file. And I'm going to put it in a directory where the Magpie service is listening. It's actually watching for new files to get input there. Looks like a 98 is a one I can try. So I'm going to copy it over to this directory where Magpie is listening. And we do see some action in the background there. It's adding all the resources that it found in that file directory. And then back in the UI, I see that my page is out of date. I want to refresh. And voila, a new document has been ingested. So the notion here is perhaps that um, you would uh, give um, your librarians or your curators access to a file share where they could drop their files. Um, another potential workflow would be you'd set up the scanners, that, like the, the scanning workflow, so that um, after documents were completed, they would be packaged up and copied over to where the server was listening. Um, in my case, I'm just like on my local box. So um, now that we have this new document in the system, I can assign it to myself. I could assign it to other users if we had other users in the system. And I go to my assigned documents and I, I see it now in my queue. And then I can go to this annotation view that we've, uh -oh. this good or bad, I can't tell. It looks like we're missing the full text. I think I chose a bad example. Let me uh, back out here a little bit. We'll try another one. No, no text. Go to PDF. Okay, well this is what I get for not practicing the demo in this very room, but. I have a suspicion that you uh, use local host in your application properties, therefore there's no new local yeah, I, I, ch I changed that in the app config and, and that got me through the cores, but okay. Static resources aren't being served up, they're being served in local um, I could edit the application properties and get that working. That's what I, mean, but I don't know. Well, well let's, let's not worry about it. But um, if I'd had my local host configured properly, we, we, we would be seeing the PDF and the text showing up in this window. And then the other part of interest is down here, we're seeing uh, metadata get assigned. And this is coming from a spreadsheet that I actually have uh, on disk. We also have a facility for grabbing metadata out of our Voyager catalog. And um, also a facility for, oh cool, yeah, getting uh, uh, suggestions based on the parsing of the full text. And so this is very collection specific. These are all like agricultural bulletins. And basically we're parsing the full text here and um, looking up the terms in the National Agricultural Library Thesaurus. And so we can, um, if we were a curator, we might favor some of these terms for um, metadata assignment. Having done that, I can now come over here and accept the document. The notion would be that once it's accepted, um, then a, uh, the curator in charge could indicate that they want to publish it. And so we're now do a rest, a set of rest calls actually to the DSpace repository. And this is against a fairly vanilla um, DSpace REST API. We had to make some minor modifications to um, uh, facilitate more manipulation on the bundle level because the DSpace 5 API was not, did not accommodate exactly everything we needed. I think changing permissions on the bundles was the particular aspect that we require. And so it's a lot of TIFFs, so it takes a little while. Okay, great. Um, and now it's published. And we can go see it in our DSpace repository, PDF and all the TIFFs. And if we look at the uh, subjects, we'll see 
um, those ones that I clicked on to add. So that's um, kind of it for the little demo here. Any questions? Is this something that's available for others to possibly use, James, I'm assuming? Yeah, you bet. Uh, it's um, on GitHub and uh, Terry made it, made it a, a hyperlink on the page for this meeting. Ah, awesome. Yeah, I should mention also that there's two repositories in GitHub. There's the service, which is the which link follows, and then um, there's the UI. It's in two separate repos. So it's um, a Spring Boot service on the back end that'll run on port 9000 if you do a Spring Boot run. And then for the UI, you'd um, just need to edit like an uh, app config file to set up your um, host. So not, not terribly difficult to uh, install, but ill-documented for all that. So are you guys using this in production at this point or is it still work in progress? You know, Tim, it's been in production about um, three times over the past two years. And I think we've got maybe about six items in the repository as a result of those efforts. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's been, it's been going from customer customer to customer. There's been a lot of turnover in the like oversight of the product, mm -hmm. and that's kind of why it fulfills so many use cases: um, DSpace, Fedora, Archivematica, and. Um, but I'm actually optimistic that we'll get this latest iteration of it into production um, by September, and um, then our agricultural librarian is going to be using it for. Um, ingesting cereals into our DSpace. Cool, sounds good. And how, like how well did the REST API you built this on work for you? Were, did you have the endpoints you needed to get the tasks done or did you have to do workarounds to work with the, the older APIs? Like I, like I said, the only, uh, it, it, for the most part, yes. The only thing that was an issue was uh, a very peculiar use case of changing permissions on bundles. Because we wanted to get the push just absolutely right. And um, in fact, in the case we're seeing here, that wouldn't have even been necessary because this is like open access. But if we were uh, pushing the documents and making them accessible only to certain groups, we wanted to like amend all the bundles to have those permissions on them. So um, for the most part, we didn't really have to do any um, major surgery on the REST API to get it to work. Is it all fair to say, team? Yeah, yeah. Really. it's some override. Yeah, well, great. Thank you for showing that. Yeah, our pleasure. And I wanted to ask folks on the call, um, I'll, I'll share with you the, the topic for our next meeting, but um, what any other ideas folks have for, for future show and tell meetings, things you're eager to learn about or eager to share with the developer community? All right, well, I will um, mention next month, um, we're going to, uh, the focus of the meeting will be on using um, Docker uh, with DSpace. I'm gonna post a link to that, um, the next meeting, which will be on August 28th. Um, so I'm, I've sort of been, been learning Docker over the last um, couple months and think it's really promising as a, as a way to um, help folks, particularly folks uh, who haven't been able to run like a, a desktop, install of DSpace in the past or found it cumbersome or difficult uh, to, um, you know, allow the project to publish some standard Docker images of DSpace and then let folks be able to, you know, easily call up, hey, I need today for something I'm testing, I need a DSpace 7 instance. Tomorrow I need the ability to uh, pull up a DSpace 5 instance and really sort of um, make that process uh, seamless and not requiring lots of um, installs beyond the Docker software. So um, I'll kind of share the state of the tools and the project images uh, where they are. Um, if, if folks have any expertise on this, um, uh, please get in touch with me because I'd love to validate uh, what we've done so far. And if you're really curious to test stuff out, it would be great to have some, some folks actually confirm that uh, the instructions look good. Because what I'll plan to do is um, step 
folks through just a very simple exercise of, hey, I want to build a DSpace 6 m um, instance on my desktop, and then next I want to build a DSpace 7 instance and kind of show um, folks the process and what's sort of promising with Docker. Sounds great, Terry. Yeah. Anything else uh, folks want to talk about? All right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for joining. And Art and James, thanks so much for uh, for presenting today. Yeah. yeah thanks, welcome. Art. Thanks, thanks Terry. And thanks, right. James. Yeah. Great to see you all. And uh, Tim, thanks for for setting up the recording. We'll get that um, posted for um, anyone else who wasn't able to join today. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks, all. All right. Take care. See you. Bye-bye.